Hello and welcome to the Sunday morning sermon for the 1st of May 2022 from Lansdowne Evangelical Free Church in West Norwood. I was unwell last week. I'm very grateful to uh, one of our elders, Lawrence Ovenden, who stepped up to preach at short notice. And we do hope there will be an audio recording of that message that will be made available on Landstand's YouTube channel so that you don't miss out on that message. Um, but just keep an eye on the channel if you subscribe to it. Um, also, that will make sure you get updates when there are new videos uploaded to the channel. We're coming to a temporary end today in our series on the book of Psalms with Psalm 23. Uh, for Easter Sunday and Good Friday, we looked at Psalm 22, which spoke of our suffering king and then prophesied about the the king's victory and the worship of the nations as they turned to the Lord because of what the king, the Lord Jesus Christ, achieved for us on Good Friday and Easter Sunday. But Psalm 23 looks at uh, the king from a different perspective. And it's written by David the shepherd, who recognises his need to be shepherded. But at the same time, it speaks to us of God's shepherding care and points us forward to David's greater son, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the Lord Jesus Christ, who says in John chapter 10 that he is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. This Psalm, Psalm 23, is full of rich teaching for us. We will only scratch the surface today, but I pray now that God would speak to you. So let's do that. Let's ask for God's help as we look at this psalm together. Let's bow before him in prayer. Our Father, we come to this passage today, which is so familiar. Lord God, we know that most people who have had any even slight contact with scriptures will know Psalm 23. Even if it's just that hymn, the Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me down to lie. In pastures green he leadeth me, the quiet waters by. And so, Lord, we pray for that freshness about this psalm, that we won't just simply switch off because we think we know it. Lord God, that you would awaken us to the glorious realities of who you are, great almighty King who shepherds his people. Father, I pray for clarity. I pray for wisdom. Uh, I pray for uh, truth. Lord, that there be this exposition will be faithful. Lord, also pray for anyone who watches this video that you would speak to them and that they would see how truly wonderful you are. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Let's read Psalm 23. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Praise God for his word. I remember when our children were younger, we had several trips to school events. And at some of these events, there were speeches, 
by supposedly inspiring people. And one of the common themes of these speeches was that the children could be whatever they wanted to be and achieve whatever they desired. They just had to work hard because they were in charge of their destiny. At the opposite extreme to such a point of view are those who say that everything is down to fate or chance and you just have to make the best of it. However, the reality is very different to both of these points of view. We are not designed by God to be the masters of our own destiny, but to be dependent upon him. We're to be shepherded by him. But the one who shepherds us is not fate or chance. It's not impersonal. Rather, it's a he. He, the good shepherd, the Lord God Almighty, who takes care of his people. And so we need to see that our lives are dependent lives. In fact, Scripture tells us, uh, even if we're not a believer, we, we, we depend for our very breath on the goodness of God. We need him. But we're not subject to fate and accident. But we're under the care of Almighty God. And the Lord, in his great wisdom, may lead us in to things where, in the eyes of the world, there is a degree of greatness. Or he may lead us on a path of insignificance. Or anywhere in between. But even the path of insignificance is greatness in his eyes and his ways. And he never makes any mistakes. And we're faced on this earth in this life here with need and how how are those needs going to be met with exhaustion we're faced with choices between right and wrong we will all face death and even before that most of us will face the death of someone that we love we face trouble and opposition and this time we face uncertainty about the future, not only our own personal futures, but the future of the world as a whole. And yet, although written in a time very different from our own, there weren't nuclear weapons, and there weren't, well, there were actually great empires, but there weren't nuclear weapons, there weren't modern, wasn't modern warfare, there wasn't an internet, there wasn't any of these things, but there was still human beings with great need, concerned about where their food would come from, concerned to ensure they had enough for the future, concerned about health, concerned about danger. And they needed to know, just as we need to know, that there is a God who is the perfect and good shepherd. So this most famous psalm is not simply something to be read at a funeral it's a psalm that speaks into all of life it reveals God it reveals our need it reveals our, his provision and it calls us firstly to come under his shepherd in care because the Lord is my shepherd this is a personal commitment a personal declaration to the one who knows the Lord and we can come to know the Lord through the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross, the good shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep. So we need to start at that point. So will you trust him? And I hope as I unpack what it means to have God as your shepherd, you will say, yes, I want to have him as my shepherd. I want to turn to him and come the way he's made for us to come, that way of righteousness he's made for me to come, which is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And then that when my time comes, I can walk the valley of the shadow of death and every dark valley that life brings on this earth, I can walk through it in confidence. And I can have an assurance that I will be in the house of the Lord forever. We need him. 
and those who already believe, we need to be reminded of who he is, how good he is, how sufficient he is, so that we too lean upon him. Life is not defined in achievements and success, does not depend on fearful toil and effort and striving in our own strength to achieve our objectives. Nor is it in the hands of impersonal fate or so-called gods who change their minds every five minutes. Our destiny lies in the hands of Almighty God. And this is what we all need to know. So please come with me on this brief journey through Psalm 23. I've already mentioned that the psalm starts with confession. The Lord is my shepherd. And then the application, the, the, the implication of that confession. I shall not want. I shall not be in need. Uh, we use want in a different sense nowadays. I want. Remember, uh, as a child, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you heard the phrase from a, a parent or particularly a grandparent. I want doesn't get. We encourage to say, please. Uh, it's not want in this sense of negative demand. It simply means I shall lack nothing. As one commentator put it, I will never lack anything. But I'm getting ahead of myself because we need to start with this first phrase. So, as I said, it's a confession. It's a declaration. We see others in scripture. Uh, perhaps uh, the most famous is that found in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. That's a declaration of faith. Later in the New Testament, we see that declaration that Jesus is Lord. And here in Psalm 23, we have that declaration taken into an application of the kind of Lord that our God is. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. It's a declaration that of his lordship, yes, but that he is one who is uh, committed to us in personal relationship and perfect provision. Notice there, he is the Lord. And in the uh, most English translations, it's there in capital letters to indicate that this is the covenant name of God. So that the Lord, who is my shepherd, is the covenant keeping, self-existent, unchanging, eternal God who is committed to care for his people with an unchanging and unbreakable commitment. That is what the name Lord means. I am that I am. I will be that I will be. He is in and of himself, all sufficient, without creator, without beginning, without end, without change. And yet he attaches that name in his revelation to his covenant people. So this is the indication of his covenant name, that he is committed with an unbreakable commitment to his people. And it's very important we, understand, we, we get hold that the key to this psalm, the key to all of life, is to know who is the shepherd. Now, I, I alluded a moment ago to, it says the Lord is my shepherd. So there needs to be that personal commitment to him in faith through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is a great comfort to know that this is personal. But it's not a great comfort to know it's personal if we don't know who is being personal with us. Who is the one who's caring for us? If I may give a, a, a slightly silly illustration, uh, a little while ago we were on holiday and we went to an animal sanctuary and there were lions there. And say for sake of argument, I was invited into the lion enclosure and um, I was told you can take this kitten with you to protect you. Now how stupid that would be. But if they were to say to me, you can go into the lion enclosure, <coughs> excuse me, 
the lion, the, 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 the head of the pack, as it were, is uh, going to go with you. And he is um, uh, tame and he's committed to taking visitors and he will not turn on you and he will defend you from the rest of the lions. Now, I know that will never happen. But the point is that if our view of God is that he's kind of up there and he's kind of nice, he's kind of like a, a kitten that we kind of admire and, and coo over and, oh, yeah, we sing some nice, lovely worship songs from time to time, then we're not going to have any strength when trouble comes. But when we realise that the one who is our shepherd is the eternal God of the universe, the Lord God Almighty is my shepherd, then we can step out with confidence into whatever this life gives to us, or whatever God permits and brings in to our circumstances in this life. Notice also not only who he is as the Lord, but what he is described as in this psalm. He is my shepherd. Now that might not seem particularly earth shattering, but if you think about, uh, as we'll look at uh, uh, next Sunday, when we look at the life of, uh, of King David, because uh, we're going to go back there to the life of King David for a season and before returning to the Psalms again a little bit later. When we go back to the life of King David, we will, we will see uh, in 1 Samuel 16 that he, the youngest, is put in charge of the sheep because it's actually not a particularly respected job. It's kind of a lowly job. And I mean, what Mark might have it important in the sense of... Um, they don't want the sheep to go. It's not given perhaps to uh, the, 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 the eldest son or it's not given to the most important servant. It's given to the least important. And so not only does we, can we sound amazed at who God is as the Lord, the covenant keeping God, we need to realise that what God is saying here is that, that, that he is, as it were, stepping down to us in his care but he's also saying it's not beneath him the lord of the universe is not beneath him to care for his people in this intimate way whereas the psalm goes on to describe it provision of pasture provision of water and if you were to reflect on the on other things the shepherd does well you see it in, in verse four protection in the dark valley Food, even though there might be, verse 5, when enemies are all surrounding, when the wolves and the bears and the lions are all around, there, there, the, still the sheep are safe with the shepherd with the abundant provision. And so we have his great majesty and glory, and yet this close care, as it were, stepping down to meet us. And of course, we see this supremely in the Lord Jesus Christ in all his humility is coming. He says in verse 14 of John chapter 10, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. And of course, you know that famous phrase, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. That's Psalm, sorry, that's John 10 and verse 11. This is him. This is your shepherd. This is your God who stepped down to rescue you. So therefore, David says, I lack nothing. I shall never lack anything. We often feel that we lack. We may have desires, may have wants in that negative sense that I referred to earlier. But the shepherd's provision is perfect and sufficient because he is perfect and sufficient and he is the owner of everything. Now, just before we move on to the explanation, which comes in verses two or three, the explanation of what it means, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Just before we come on to that, just a moment. The flip side of this wonderful confession of faith is an admission that I'm a sheep. And you know what? Sheep are pretty dumb. 
sheep can't look after themselves. Sheep are worried about food and water and sheep will wander off in less protected. Sheep have got no means of defending themselves. Sheep are very fearful. If you ever walk through a field or you drive over one of those country lanes and there are sheep around, they're scattering everywhere. We need him. We need a shepherd. And if you're a Christian, you're shepherded by the loving and almighty creator of the universe. But then in verses two and three, we have the shepherding explained. We see in verse two, and just to pause for a moment, we don't see in verses two and three, great drama. We don't see a shepherd fighting massive armies. We don't see that the shepherd lifting the sheep up in, in, into an oasis of the best grass in the, in the entire universe. We see normal sheep life. A normal sheep life need pasture, they need to eat, and they need water, they need to drink. And so we need to see that God's shepherding care, while God can and does do mighty miracles and transform situations in our lives, most of God's shepherding care is in the normal day-to-day -day stuff of life. The fact that we breathe, the fact that he does in answer to the prayer he told, told us to pray, he does give us our daily bread. For many people in the West, we find our daily bread is provided for many days ahead, but it's still his provision. I mean, to, to act as, or to, 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 to trust him as his provision each day, because we do not know what tomorrow may bring. This is daily care, ordinary daily provision, which means he's able to say, he makes me lie down. As one commentator uh, mentioned, sheep are not very good at lying down because they're worried about what's going on around them. They're very agitated and, they, oh, and, and they're worried about flies that buzz around them and, and, and they, so they start shaking and they start moving off. Uh, they, they're worried about food, so they keep running off and eating and then looking for places to drink. But here, David lies down because there's nothing to fear. And we, while we have jobs to do, and God has given us ministries to carry out. We have responsibilities. We need to be able to lie down in sleep, free from anxiety, because our shepherd is in charge. He knows what he's doing. He's working everything out in his glorious purposes. Our trustworthy, perfect shepherd. And we can cast our anxieties on him because he cares for us. Verse 3, he restores my soul. And soul here refers to all of life. He restores our soul, uh, as we, we, we saw in Psalm 19, verse 7, which uses the same word here as the same word for restore. Um, he, the, 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 the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving or restoring the soul. But it also has that sense, uh, as we looked at, um, in Psalm 19 of, of, of repentance, of turning around. So uh, the Lord's shepherding care is constantly to turn our heart, to turn our beings towards him. Because in the light of his presence, it's as we gaze upon his face, as we lean upon him, that we are nourished and satisfied and strengthened. And of course, he's a perfect leader. Isaiah 53 verse 6 reminds us, all we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of, of us all. But here in um, Psalm 23, 3, he leads me in paths of righteousness, 
right path. He directs my steps. As a Christian, he directs your steps by his word and by his spirit that you may walk in those right paths and live for his glory. And he oversees our lives. He teaches us right living, yes, but he oversees our lives and directs our steps and overrules our circumstances. And he guarantees these things. Look at the end of verse three. For his name's sake. God's name is who he is. And he's saying here, i have staking my whole reputation upon this. I am not going to let you down. I'm not going to change. I'm not going to fail. He is God and he will not allow his reputation to be damaged by failing us. This means he's always our shepherd. And then in verse four and verse five, he applies the shepherding to two different circumstances. One is about the kind of paths of righteousness that the Lord will sometimes lead us down. And the other is about the Lord's provision in what seem to be impossible circumstances. It's not a coincidence that verse four follows verse three. Having spoke about paths of righteousness, he then talks about walking in the deepest valley, the darkest valley, which interesting is actually a, a better translation than a traditional one of the valley of the shadow of death. While it includes death, there is no question about that. I think it will be a mistake to think that verse four is just talking about death. It's rather talking about all those dark, troublesome times when it seems we're in the deepest valley and we can't see the way ahead and we are fearful because it seems to be very dangerous and the, the, the future is not clear. And that can be bereavement, that can be, yes, death, that can be sickness, that can be financial trouble, that can be mental health, that can be burdens about our family, that can be uh, difficulties in our, our work situation, wherever it may be, difficulty with neighbours, we feel like we're going through a dark valley. But this is part of the paths of righteousness. The devil is not in charge of the valley. The shepherd would lead the sheep to different places of pastures through these valleys. And the shepherd was in charge. And that's why uh, the psalmist can say, I will fear no evil. The Lord is my shepherd. And it's because, and notice here, the, 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 the change in, in, in the way it's expressed. So verse two and three, he makes me lie down. He restores my soul. Verse four, I will fear no evil for you are with me. This has now become personal. He recognized this shepherd is personally his shepherd. And this is the same shepherd mentioned in verse one, that the Lord who is the covenant keeping, self-existent, unchanging, eternal, committed, faithful God. This is the one who is alongside David. He is with him and he is also at work. So he says, he says, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod would, it refers to a stick or a club where which he could whack lions and and wolves over the head. He could whack any enemies, he could any thieves that would come could get a firm blow to protect the sheep. And the staff is to guide and direct and pull the sheep out of the messes the sheep get themselves in when they fall into a ditch or whatever it might be. He will direct and guide. No wonder he says, they will come for me. Here is with me. In the deepest valleys of life and even of death, he is with me, the eternal covenant-keeping, unchanging, self-existent God who's committed to me in, in an unbreakable covenant. He is with me and he fights for me and he protects and guides me. No wonder he says they comfort me. But there's something here also which is really important. Verse 4 is not a prayer. 
it is a, and the same with verse five, it's a declaration. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying we don't pray. We need to pray. When you're going through the valley, you pray. Other Psalms pray, out of the depths I cry to you, and so on. You know, you can read the Psalm and find so many prayers for the valley. There's also a place in the valley for declaring the truth about who God is. And this is what Psalm 23 is. The Lord is my shepherd. And then he explains, I shall not, then he explains what that means. And now he's, saying, now he's saying, this is what you do. So he's building his faith. He's assuring his own soul by means of the word, by means of who God is. And as we also do the same through the, the power of the Holy Spirit, our souls are turned uh, back to him, away from looking at the darkness and the problems, turned back to him to look at him. And it's done here by means of worship and reminding ourselves and speaking the truth. That this is what you do, Lord. You do these things. It's the same kind of idea in verse five. You prepare, same idea, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. So verse four is the path. Verse two is the provision. So going back, sorry, verse five is the provision. Verse four is the path. The path of righteousness includes the valley. Verse five is the mirror of verse two where it says you make me lie down in green pastures, you lead me beside still waters. And, and, and here that David is saying, even when I'm surrounded by enemies, I still lack nothing. In fact, God is so good as an able to provide for me an absolute abundance. And this is all around care. There's a feast, there's a table. There is anointing with oil, which, of course, a sheep would have needed for healing of wounds and, and the removal of, 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 of flies and so on. The oil over the sheep to protect them. So there is provision. There is protection and healing and, 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 and joy, which oil brings to refresh the faith in a dry and hot land. And also uh, there is a cup that overflows. The abundance as it were, of new wine at a feast, even though the enemy is still on the prowl. And you know, often in those darkest times, we feel the presence of the Lord even more close. We feast on his faithfulness. We feast on his goodness. We are drenched with his precious presence. And our hearts are in the midst of sorrow and trouble and danger overjoyed. The testimony of so many who have suffered for their faith is the depth of joy in the midst of the darkest and most dangerous place. This is our God. This is our shepherd. <coughs> Excuse me. And finally, we have anticipation. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. In other words, for my entire lifespan. How long will the shepherding care last for? All your life. All your life. There are two aspects, <coughs> excuse me, mentioned here. Goodness. God's goodness. He is a giver of good things. He turns even the hard things to good things he works <clears throat> all things for the good of those who love him goodness and mercy or actually better covenant love which is what the word means the unbreakable covenant love of God these things follow us all the days of our life or actually again better pursue us all the days of our life as it were at our heels every step we will see that God is pursuing us with goodness good things turning difficulties to our good uh, the good of our spiritual life uh, the uh, good for all eternity <clears throat> and he will never let go of us 
constantly that, that covenant commitment and his care and his provision pursuing us all the days of our life. And this is not some kind of idea that, that, that we look over our shoulder and like uh, some people of you have, have dogs who um, you take for a walk and then not only that interest, they kind of waddle along behind you. You see my older dogs kind of like trudging along behind, not particularly interested. And then we kind of think that God's care is like that, that God kind of, you, you look over your shoulder and you see, yeah, maybe God's looked after me a bit here and there. And there's like the dog kind of prodding along. No, this is like a bloodhound chasing you. All the time, God is showing you his goodness. All the time, God is proving to his covenant love. He's not going to let you go. He is with you. And the, the, the thing I would encourage you is, I say, God, open my eyes. Remember that servant of Elisha, Gehazi, who was so terrified of, of the Syrian army. And the Lord said to him, Lord, open his eyes. And he saw the chariots all around Elijah, the heavenly chariots. I need our eyes to be opened to see that always God is pursuing us, chasing us, holding us up. Yes, there are enemies, but he is there strengthening, guiding, comforting, giving us his goodness, proving his steadfast love. And then we can therefore be confident because of that, that no one shall snatch us out of his hand. So we shall enter into the house of the Lord and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And there is a sense, of course, from which David would have been referring to his own coming to worship God because he is safe in the Lord. He can come before the tabernacle and worship God. But the, 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 the pairing up of all the days of my life with in the house of the Lord forever surely point us to beyond that, that there is an eternal dwelling that Jesus himself refers to when he lays down his life for his sheep. And then later in John chapter 14, he says, where I am, you will be there also. There is a dwelling in the house of the Lord forever. That is the destiny. That is the anticipation that David has. And so we see there is a looking here in several directions. The, 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 the first direction is to actually look at the Lord. And I would urge you to do that if you're not yet a Christian. Look at the Lord because all of these precious things are only possible for those who've come under his shepherding care. You need to look with faith. You need to look at the cross where Jesus laid down his life for his sheep. You need to look at the empty tomb to see that Jesus defeated death. And look with faith and turn to him and put your trust in him. And then when you have, or if you already have, Remind yourself of who God is. Dwell much on who he is. Second, look at your own wants. And ask yourself, the thing that I'm striving for, is this something that I really, really need? I'm becoming unsatisfied with God's care because actually I'm desiring things that are not necessary for my satisfaction and delight in him. I not to say that God cannot give an abundance beyond what we need, but often we become agitated and fearful about losing things we don't really need or about not having things that we don't really need. And to be look, look up and then to look within and search our own hearts and attitudes so that we can be able to say with absolute confidence, I shall lack nothing. Because I know who my God is and I know what my needs are and I know that he's going to meet them. But then we need to look with confidence at whatever we're facing, whatever valley we're going through now, whatever it may go, uh, we may experience in the days that lie ahead, whatever troubles they are, I mean to look into his word and seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit to recognize that we walk in paths of righteousness in line with his will as revealed in scripture and trusting him to lead us and trusting him to provide. And then we look back, 
Surely goodness and mercy have followed me all the days of my life. Remind ourselves of his faithfulness. And then we look forward. Therefore, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And until that day, goodness and mercy shall continue to follow me. May the Lord increase our confidence in him and our dependence upon him and our satisfaction with him and our assurance whether it's in the pastures, in the valleys, or surrounded by enemies, that he is sufficient, that he is good, that he will protect, that he'll provide, and that he will take us all the way. Let's pray. Our Father, there's so much in this psalm. Please, whatever... <laughs> is the most important thing for us to receive today. Lord, stamp it, imprint it upon our hearts and minds and help us to live it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> amen. May you be abundantly encouraged because the Lord is your shepherd. The Lord is. God Almighty, and may he bless you in abundance. Amen.